Mr. Uh, Rashik Parmar, thank you for joining us. And thank thank you. you for joining the D Dubai Smart Cities Forum uh, and bringing some of the insight uh, to the audience today. Uh, I would like to ask you a few questions uh, to share with our audience. And one of the things that come to mind every time the, the, the notion of smart cities is mentioned is that smart cities are usually places where ICT, big data, citizen engagement, human uh, capital development, fuel society's innovation, uh, and ability to solve problems related to uh, public service, to uh, enhancing livability, workability, and sustainability. Um, these are, this is one definition of many in smart cities area. Right. What's yours? Yeah, so you know the question of what is a smarter city is one that we've uh, grappled with for many years. And I always go back to the definition. So, so we started working on the program back in 2007. And, and at the time, we want to be very clear and precise on what we meant by a smarter city. And we were very careful in defining it as a smarter city, not a smart city. Because there isn't an end point. It's a journey. It's a continuous journey. So a smarter city is one which is clear on what its value is in the global ecosystem. What is it trying to create as economic global value? Uh, underpinning that is then a platform of government policies which allows that, that uh, capability to emerge, a set of businesses that commercialize the value from that, um, academic endeavor which allows that, that competitive advantage to stay valuable in an enduring way, and then infrastructure which doesn't um, overburden the, the capability but creates sufficient competitive advantage for the city to continue to be a global value in, in X. And so a smarter city is one which links together all aspects of life in the city and is one that people want to stay in because it's got global value. Well, that's, that's a very important element. The other element that comes to mind always when you talk about smart city is people. Um, public en engagement through <coughs> ICT or information and communication technology yeah. is, a, is something that is on the radar screen of many governments in the region here uh, as well yeah. as globally. Yeah. Um, and it is in the DNA of the city of the future, if you like, with uh, large metropolitan areas. So the increased penetration of ICTs in society, there's now a critical mass of users for multiple technologies. And in places like UAE and Dubai, it's one of the highest in the region. How to best leverage these opportunities and enablers, if you like, yeah. in, in developing the smart city infrastructure? So this is a fantastic question because um, for a city to be smarter, it's got to learn from everybody. So it's got to learn about what the problems are and issues are pe people face. It's got to learn about those little frictions that make it hard for somebody to live their daily life. Uh, and so a smarter city is one that engages in a two-way dialogue between the leadership and the citizens. Uh, and as you say, technology provides that ability to that. Social media allows you to have that two-way dialogue. Uh, but how do you engage in a conversation with a million people continuously? That becomes a technological challenge. And what we're now seeing is the ability of um, textual analytics allows us to draw meaning and insight from those discussions, understand sentiment of the citizen, understand what's most important at this moment in time, and be able to inform the public policy in a way in which um, provides the right platform for future value. Um, but, but at the same time, you get an instant response. When you launch any public policy, individuals who are affected by that can give you instant response. So you need to understand how you leverage social media to be that two-way dialogue. Um, and one of the failings that I see in many cities around the world is they try and see social media as a, a mouthpiece, a way of one-way communications. And that, quite frankly, will not cut it. You've got to have a two-way dialogue. Um, and a great example here is Coventry. Right? So go back a, a number of years ago, we had the Cov Jam, which is, which is a two-way dialogue between the city leadership and the city itself, the citizens. And coming out of that, they got 4,000 new ideas for how they could improve the city. And that informed Martin Reeves' program on how he drives up you know, the, uh, the, the evolution of the city. Which brings me um, to the next question. Um, with the massive number of devices, uh, sensors, uh, things connected to the internet and producing data in, in a city, yeah. um, data is uh, at the core of smart cities development. And uh, a smart city, as I understand, utilizes data and information and communication technology infrastructure to collect and share, and communicate, and analyze this data as you uh, highlighted right. in your example, right. in order to assess, predict, and, and plan yeah. uh, in, in, in the urban uh, structures. Um, with this 
prevalent culture among governments globally and in this region as well of information silos within the government yeah. and uh, limited collaborations, limited le levels of collaborations within the government. Uh, it seems that the challenge will be in the sharing uh, data and collaboration paradigms. Uh, how can we overcome this? Are there any examples globally? That's a, yeah, the, the challenge of integration of the siloed information sources is, is a pervasive problem across, across the world. And in fact, um, you know, the, the reason for that is manifold. One of the reasons is actually um, privacy uh, and making sure that the information that was gathered is being used for the, the purpose it was gathered for. Um, some of the reasons are because of efficiency. Some of the reasons are historical. Uh, and so we have to go back and ask ourselves, why do we want to bring this information together? And by bringing it together, are we really improving the society in the right way? Are we driving the evolution of the city in the way that matters to us and the, and the citizens and the businesses, of course? And so by informing the agenda in the right way, you can start to overcome some of these barriers. And, um, and, and there are some very good examples. And, and actually, New York is probably the best example. If you look at how New York got itself to the point where it's one of the safest cities in the world, it was by bringing together the siloed information that existed in the various police departments, the criminal, criminal investigation departments. By those, those siloed sets of information meant that the police officer wasn't informed at the point of um, interaction with a potential offender. By not being informed, he couldn't make the decisions in the right, you know, at that moment in time, you need exactly the right insights. Um, through that, that integration of data, we could get a complete view of that individual and be able to give him some real information to, to help him decide sh how he should act. Right? And that's a, a good example of how we can get it right. Um, other examples are, you, you look at uh, Malta. Malta brought together the information about electricity and water to start to transform the way in which uh, desalination works and, and actually drive down the cost of desalination significantly. Now, those two bits of information could be kept completely separate and we may not have found that, that potential value. Uh, another example of integrated information is actually a city that's very close to, to my heart, which is um, Glasgow. Uh, Glasgow had this program of sustainability and they, they launched a challenge which was called f how do we address fuel poverty? And for those who don't know, fuel poverty is where you have um, individuals spend greater than 10% of their income heating the home. So they're literally are heating the home. And um, not surprisingly, a lot of that is in the underprivileged part of the city. And so fuel poverty is a, is a massive challenge. Um, and traditional information sources didn't let you understand some of the challenges that existed. So we took a thermal map. We took a thermal map of the city and you could see exactly where heat was being dissipated from, from parts of the city. And not surprisingly, the housing associations, which are the poorest parts of the city, is where lots of heat was being popped out. So they were badly insulated at Victorian homes. And to our surprise, very close to them was, it was a red dot, which was much brighter than any of the dots that were around. And so we started to investigate inside this, and we found actually it was a power station. The power station was heating water actually was actually cooling the turbines. It was using water to cool the turbines. The steam that was generated for that was, was being pumped into the sky. It wouldn't be too hard to then take that steam and put pipes into the district homes, which were nearby, and provide a district heating scheme to drive down fuel poverty. You know? Now, we wouldn't have found that by bringing together all the information sources, right? And once we'd got that, it was obvious. It was blindingly obvious. But those are some of the examples of how, by getting the real information together and showing what value you can create from it, you then earn the right to do some more innovation. Well, that's an excellent example of how big data can enable some of these innovative solutions. Right. Um, my last question is about the risks going through this long journey, as you put it in one of your um, comments. There's a smart city development uh, process that is long and there's a lot of learning to be uh, taken and it's some of the risks that we learned if we are to look at the development of the electronic government era in in this region at least from from this context uh, there are some many actuality gaps that are there 
uh, of copying and not fitting a solution that doesn't fit, but is copied from a place that it worked in, yeah. uh, ignoring local realities and, and context, there are always the single-sided view of as, as a technological mission, mm -hmm. looking at the smart city development as a technological yeah. mission rather than in its uh, whole. And there's always the vendor-driven approach that in many cities probably suffer from. Uh, in this long journey, where do we start, uh, given these risks in yeah. mind? Yeah. A great question. You know, where do you start is something that uh, I've struggled with, with with many, many cities. And uh, you know, we've worked now with over 2,500 cities around the world. And it, it's consistent. Any smart cities project that's going to be successful has to have three aspects. The first aspect is you need to understand the issues that really matter to everybody. And I mean really matter to everybody. So it's got to matter to the government. It's got to matter to the businesses. It's got to matter to the citizens. It's got to matter to the agencies that sit around that, the social businesses, the advisory bodies. Everybody's got to care about this issue. So unless you find something that really matters, don't start. The second um, challenge is investment. You can't make anything happen without real investment. And that investment is often very difficult to come by because you're going to ask individuals or businesses or systems or, or service providers to make changes and they won't necessarily benefit from those changes. They're doing things for the greater good of the city itself and they may not see value for many, many years to come. So how do you engage those, how do you get investment streams so that they get appropriately rewarded for the investments that they make? Second part, investment is a, is a big and complex topic. And then the third topic is you can't make change on your own. You need to create an ecosystem of partners who make change together. And, and this is a case where any one individual who doesn't succeed means the whole project fails. Right? So you have to really bring everybody together. And this really takes an inspiring leader. It takes a leader who has the charisma, has the commitment, has the enduring courage to really take the program and, and achieve some realities, achieve those outcomes you set out. And, and I look at engagements around the world, and if any one of those three aren't there, the projects will fail. They are all equally important. So unless you start with the, the inspiring vision, the, the, the real issue that matters, you won't start unless you have investment that you can really make this program happen and then you have that inspiring leader that can make this really come to life. Excellent. Um, this is probably where uh, Dubai has one of the uh, key enablers, which is there's a strong leadership, st strong political support uh, for such initiatives and right. visionary uh, 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 a vision towards how the city should look like in the future. Right. And I think uh, given uh, the insight you've provided us, we have now a wealth of information that we can also share with uh, some of our students and stakeholders. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Rashik Parmar, uh, President of the IBM's Academy of Technology. Thank you for joining us again and looking forward to uh, working together in the future. Thank you, it's my pleasure.